like to brag about my staff, although I still do it. And uh, and we have a great staff here. I mean, we are so blessed at the Crossroads with the staff that we have. Uh, I could not have envisioned this when Eileen and I came 12 years ago to, to start the Crossroads that even in a small community of faith like we have, with perhaps 125 people worshiping on Sunday, that we'd have four or five young people that would come and say, we feel called to ministry, and we feel called to ministry at the church of uh, the Crossroads, and we're doing it without a salary. You know, our associate pastors don't get paid. And they're serving literally because God has called them, and this is where they want to be. They're working by vocationally. One's a credit union manager. One delivers mattresses, and a third works at a labeling company up in Columbus. And, uh, and the way that they serve and the effort that they give, is it's such a blessing to me. And, and last week, man, I'll tell you what, there are, Joe's sermon, Pastor Joe's sermon last week really, really touched my heart, really convicted me of some attitudes that I had. As he talked about the idea that family is us. You know, it's not your biological family. And he used an example in the first service, which he didn't use in the second service. So you didn't, if you came to second service last week, you didn't hear this illustration. But he used the illustration of grafting skin. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone through a skin graft. I've not, but I've had, I had a brother who had a terrible accident, and they did a lot of skin grafting with him. And literally what they do is they take a piece of skin, a piece of flesh, off of one part of your body. They take it off. It's removed. And then they put it on another part of your body where it grows in. And I thought of that illustration is the illustration of the church. See, when you become a Christian, when you give your, your allegiance to Jesus Christ, you're, you're removed from that old life. And you're grafted into a brand new life. And, and that life is called the body of Christ, the church. And so when the Bible speaks about family, it's not speaking about, most of the time, it's not speaking about mother and father and sister and brother, our biological stuff. It's thinking about our spiritual family. And so the question gets asked, do you love your spiritual family like you love your biological family? And I had to say, no, I don't. If my brother called and said, man, I'm hurting for money, can you send me a few bucks? It's in the mail already. If my sister called and says, man, I'm hurting, I just need somebody to talk to, I'm all ears. If one of my daughters or my son uh, needs my attention for something, I'm there. Two weeks ago or a week and a half ago... I give that much resource to you? Would I devote that much of my life and that much of my time and that much of my resource to you? And I was convicted because the answer was pretty easy. No, I wouldn't. I like to think of myself as this guy who really cares, but when it comes right down to it. And, and so then I'm thinking Jesus said, you know, these knuckle-headed Pharisees come to him and they're trying to trick him and so they say, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus turns to them very quickly without hesitation. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And boy, those, they're puffing up. Oh, we do that. Yeah, we really love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he stopped and goes, and the second is equal to that. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the full manifest, and then he said, all of the laws and the prophets are based on these two principles. Loving the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. And I asked a question a couple of weeks ago, how do you love you? If you're not loving your labor or your neighbor the way you love you, you're not fulfilling that commandment that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I look at that, and I look in the mirror, and I'm convicted by that. And so today's message is kind of an extension of what Pastor Joe preached last week, but it's a message that we need to hear in this church because, see, we have a certain amount of love in the crossroads. 
there are people that will testify, we came to the crossroads because we felt loved and cared for more than any other church we'd ever been in. And, and that's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm, I, I love to hear those kinds of testimonies because we should be doing that. We shouldn't only be friends to ourselves. We should be friends to the visitors that come in. As you look around the room this morning, you may see someone here this morning who you don't know. I just challenge you, go meet that person. Shake their hand and say, hey, I'm so-and-so. Who are you? And how did you come to visit the crossroads? And we're so glad you're here today. And you do that pretty well. But we need to take it to the next step. We need to start loving our neighbor as ourselves. I need to be loving you like I love my biological children. Because according to the Bible, you are equal to them. You know what? We can put away all the... All the I don't want to hear the words, okay? I, I know what's coming. What's coming is, well, Jim, you don't actually expect me to treat that guy over there that maybe needs a shave or hasn't showered in a while. You don't actually expect me to think of him like I do my daughter. Yes. Yes, I do. Not because I do, but because God does. We're going to be talking about that this morning. We're going to be talking about God's expectations for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Because I'm convinced that we will not reach the world until we begin to love one another. Genuinely, truly investing in one another and loving one another. See, do you care about the people outside the walls of this church? You know, right now, within about 15 miles of where you're sitting, if you were to draw a circle and or put a point on a map and draw a circle, within about 15 miles of where you're sitting right now, there's probably 100,000 people that live with Watertown, Lake Mills, Waterloo, Conemawak, Jefferson, Watertown, Johnson Creek, Exonia, all those, Farmington, there's about 100,000 people. Statistics hold up, 87,000 of the 100,000 do not have a faith in God, in Jesus Christ. And if the world were to end today, those 87,000 people would go to hell. Now, Jesus talked about hell. Uh, in this morning's service, we welcomed two new members into our church. Sean and Rachel White joined our church this morning, and we extended them the right hand of fellowship. And I asked Sean and Rachel to, to share with us how their spiritual journey began. And Sean said he went to a Bible camp when he was eight years old, and the whole week, the Bible camp, the campfire lessons were about hell. And he thought, wow, as an eight-year-old, to hear all that preaching about hell. But by the end of the week, one of the teachers had talked about this great judgment that's going to take, one, take place one day where all the people are going to stand before God and those that have worshipped Jesus will come in and those that have wor not worshipped Jesus will be sent away. And he said, I didn't want to be in that group. And so I gave Jesus my life. And his spiritual journey began. And I thought, you know, we don't hear sermons about hell much anymore in churches. I guess it's just not politically correct to, to talk about all the negativity. But Jesus certainly talked about it. And Jesus told the story of a rich man and Lazarus and how this rich man had all this money and all this wealth and all this, the, the American dream. And he, and he didn't even share his crumbs with, his, with the poor beggar named Lazarus. It says that they died. And when they died, it says the rich man woke up in torment in hell. And he saw Father Abraham afar and he said to Father Abraham, can you send somebody to dip their finger in water and touch my tongue to cool me because I'm in pain and agony in this place? Hell is real. Hell is not some fictitious thing somebody made up. One day, this thing we call life is going to come to an end. Either it'll end because you die or it'll end because Jesus Christ comes back. And the next time he comes back, he's not coming back as a suffering servant in a manger. He's coming back as the righteous judge to judge the world. And when that happens, the door is forever closed. And those that have placed a, faith, a saving faith in Jesus Christ, they'll be entered into heaven forever to be with God. But those that are shut out will be shut out forever 
in darkness and pain. It says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the reason I'm so graphic in telling you about this is because I want to know, do you care? Do you care that 87,000 people within 15 miles of this place will die and go into that kind of hell forever? Does that even bother you? Or are you just sitting there saying, well, I got mine. They can get theirs. Here's where I'm going with this. It ties back in. Jesus said in John 13, 33, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, the, what the world needs more than anything else right now is examples of Christians loving Christians. What the world needs now more than anything else is an example of disciples loving disciples. That is a magnetic faith. If we start to love each other like we love our own blood right, relatives, people are going to want to be a part of what we're doing. I look at what we're doing in Columbus right now with the food pantry and the paper pantry, and people are flocking to our doors because we're giving away paper products, toilet paper and paper towels and Kleenex, and we're giving away hygiene items, uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes and razors and shaving cream and, so and, and hand soap and, and bar soap and hair shampoo. And we're giving away cleaning supplies like toilet bowl cleaner and Ajax and, and dish soap. And now we're giving away meat and cereal and bread. And along with it, we even get to give them some candy and some sodas. And people are flocking to our door because nobody else is doing that. Do you see how magnetic that is when you just love people the way you love your kids? And as we begin to really move into the community in Columbus, we'll be able to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we showed them how much we cared before we taught them how much we knew. That's my iPad, don't worry about it. And so I want to challenge each and every one of you this morning to listen carefully to what we're saying because God wants to change each and every one of you. He wants to help you become a lover of the brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and families in this room. We are your family. I am your father. I am your brother. I am your son just as much as any father, brother, or son that you'll ever have. And you ought to start treating me that way. And you are my father, you're my mother, you're my sister, you're my brother, you're my daughter, you're my son, and I ought to start treating you that way. So 1 John is where we're going, and uh, 1 John is a letter that John wrote to the churches in, in uh, the area that he ministered in. And uh, 1 John is really a cool book. It's, it's really almost an entire Bible melted down into a few short chapters. You can read the entire uh, epistle of first john in about 15 minutes it's not not long at all but man it is packed full of stuff and so when we look at first john 1 john is doing two things in first john 1 he's saying jesus is who he said he was we saw him we touched him we heard him we watched him die we watched him come back from the dead we watched him work miracles and we watched him ascend into heaven he is who he said he was and then the second part is, and you can be what he wants you to be if you're willing to make a change in your life. And we hear that great verse that many of us have memorized in 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now I want to stop right there for a minute. That's not where we're going to be. We're going to be in chapter 2. But I want to stop right there for a minute because I want you to understand something. You cannot have salvation without first being sorry. You cannot have salvation until you understand that you have a death penalty on your head and you are on your way to hell and you have no hope. No hope is survival. Until you get to that point, you can't fully embrace a Savior Lord. 
You can hang around and be a good person. You can look like a church member. You can look like a Christian, but you won't be a Christian until you first understand that you have failed in the eyes of God. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard, so the best among us doesn't measure up. There's a shortfall between God's righteousness and our righteousness, and we cannot bridge that gap. And because of that, we are all going to hell. Dark, painful, eternal existence without God. And there ain't no party going on down there. Satan, the devil ain't in charge of hell. It was built for him, and he will suffer more than anyone else in hell. So this idea of what well, all my friends will, will have a great party in hell, no, you won't. You will suffer alone in agony forever. And until we get to that point, until we understand that, until we believe it, we really can't ex experience salvation. And so 1 John 1, 9 says, look, you, there's a gap between your righteousness and God's righteousness. You can't bridge it on your own. You can never get there. He'll never come here. And you have a problem. And we've resolved that problem by providing Jesus. And so 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins. In order for me to confess my sins, I have to be at a point where I recognize I am a sinner. And I have failed God and I don't measure up, and I'm on my way to hell. So we have to start there. And if I confess those sins, then Jesus is faithful and will forgive me, and he'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And all of a sudden, that gap between my righteousness and God's righteousness is closed, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so that's 1 John, where John is sending it. And now he shifts a little bit and he says, okay, now that you've confessed your sins, now that God has forgiven you those sins, now that he's brought your righteousness up to God's righteousness through his work on the cross, here's what you should look like. And that's where we want to be this morning. In John chapter, or 1 John 2, 1, it says, My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. So John is telling us right up front, the reason I'm about to tell you what I'm about to tell you is so you won't sin. Now, I was saved at the age of eight, that's almost 56 years ago. And here's what I know. I have sinned a lot since I was eight years old. So Christians aren't sinless. They just sin less. You get me? They're not sinless, they just sin less. And so John said, look, what God, what the Holy Spirit is giving me to give you is so that you will not sin. And you go, well, but I, I do sin. John is too late, I've already sinned. And he goes, okay, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now think about that for a minute. We're saved, 1 John 1, 9, we've confessed our sins, we knew we were going to hell. We didn't want to go to hell. We confessed our sins. We asked Jesus to forgive us. He did forgive us. He put his righteousness on us. Now we're meeting the standard because of what he did. And now he says, look, don't sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate. And you think about that word advocate. What's an advocate? Well, if I was going to buy a house, Joe, Joe Pa, Pastor Joe's kind of an advocate. Joe works for the, federal, uh, the Fort Credit Union. Joe has talked to his loan officer. He said, hey, my boss at the church, Jim Plater, needs to refinance his house. And I want to help him get that done. What does he need to do and how can I help you? The guy's honest, he pays his bills, he's, you know, he just needs to get his house refinanced. And so the guy at the credit union sends home some paperwork with Joe, Joe sends it to me, I sign it, Joe takes it back, he says, Here's it. give it as much consideration as you can give it, right? That would be an advocate. Joe would be advocating for me. Well, what happens is, because I'm not sinless, but do sin less, when I do sin, I have an advocate before God the Father. This righteous, holy God who cannot have any unrighteous, unholy things in his presence is saying there's sin, and my advocate, Jesus Christ, is saying, Dad, I already paid for that sin with my death. It's paid for in full. 
And those of us who have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, we have an advocate 24-7 looking out for us. He's got our back. When we mess up, he's there before God saying, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for our sins, but for also, also for the sins of the whole world. Do you understand? Now, if you read that verse, you go, well, wait a minute. As I read this verse, everybody's going to heaven. Because it says right here that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for all the sins of the whole world. And, and that is true. He absolutely has paid for all the sins that will ever be committed, all the sins that are being committed, and all the sins that will ever be committed before time ends. His one death paid for all of that. The Son of God died for all of that. But it's like this. Supposing this Christmas, I gave each of you a gift in a little box. And you say, oh, that's nice. The pastor gave me a gift. And you take it home and you put it in your closet and you never open it. And over the next 40 to 45 years, there were times when you had financial troubles. You had to struggle. You lost your job or you had some bills you couldn't pay or got a pay cut or whatever. Car broke down. Over the next 40 to 45 years, you had some of those things. And over the next 40 to 45 years, you had some health issues. Maybe you got cancer or, or you had uh, a heart attack or, or maybe you had to have a kidney removed or something. And over the next 45 years, you had some relational problems. Maybe your kids don't love you anymore. Your wife left you. Your husband left you. Or something like that happened. And at the end of your life, you're saying, man, you know, some bad things happened to me. And I'm there and I go, well, did you open that gift I gave you? You go, what gift? Now, I gave you a gift a long time ago. And you go, no, what was in it? And you, well, well there was a million dollars in it. Would that have helped you through some of your financial troubles? And there was also in there a, a, a doctor who cures cancer. Didn't you call him? And, and there was also a book in there on how to, how to heal relationships. And all of a sudden, you start to discover, man, there was all this help for me, but I never opened the gift. That's what's going on here. See, Jesus died for all the sins of all the world, but God will not force his love on anyone. And so God says, look, I got this gift for you. It's called eternal life, and all you got to do is open the package. You got to step out in faith and say, I will allow Jesus Christ to take my place on the cross and die for me, and I will give him my life. So the world's sins are atoned for, but most of the world reject Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there are people in churches who call themselves Christians who reject Jesus Christ. They think they're going to get to heaven based on good works. I talked to a guy this week. I said, well, let me ask you, if you stood before the gates of heaven and Jesus said, why should I let you in, what would you tell him? And he said, well, I'd tell him I've been a pretty good guy. I haven't killed anybody, and, and you know, I've done a lot of good things. I help my neighbors. And at that point, I said, you're damned. He goes, why? I said, you're damned. He goes, why? I said, because you spit on the death of Jesus on the cross. See, if you think you can be good enough to get into God's kingdom, then why would Jesus have had to die? What kind of father would kill his kid for me if I could do that on my own? And so people who reject Christ, even though that gift is out there, they just haven't opened the gift. And that's what John is saying here. John is saying, look, you have, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you have an advocate, and that advocate has... Paid for all the sins in all the world, and anybody can have that. That's the good news. We're going to be talking about that next year a lot. The good news. See, gospel, we hear that a lot, gospel. Gospel means good news. I don't like to use the word gospel because nobody knows what it means anymore. They think it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels. Gospel means good news. What good news? The good news that you don't have to die and go to hell. You can live with God eternally. When Jesus said peace on earth, he wasn't talking about the absence of war and fighting with your neighbors. Is there still that stuff today? Yeah. He was talking about reconciliation with God. We were apart from God, and now we're reconciled to God. And that's the peace that Jesus brings. You go ahead and read the Gospels, and in the Gospel, Jesus said, look, if you think I came to bring peace on earth, you're wrong. I, brought, I came to divide father and mother, husband and wife, son and daughter. Why? Because people hate Jesus. 
and you become a Christian and you sell out to Jesus Christ, there are going to be some of your relatives that won't like you anymore. Is that peace? The peace that Jesus brings is reconciliation with God, which is so much more valuable than peace with our neighbors and our relatives. And so John is saying here, he's our atoning sacrifice, and not only for ours, but of all the sins of the whole world. And then he gets right down to the nitty-gritty. He says, we know that we have come to know him. How do I know I'm a believer? How do I know I'm really going to get to heaven, Jim? All, the, all my life in churches, people said, if you obey the Ten Commandments or you follow this list of do's and don'ts, you're going to be good. And you just told me that isn't good enough. How do I know? And it says right here, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. See, when I'm obeying God, I have no doubt I'm in the kingdom. But when I'm disobeying God, I'm not so sure. And I think it's even more pointed than that. It says we, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. And what are his commands? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But if anyone or whoever says, whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. Now people say to me, Jim, you're so intense. And I am. I'm intense watching football or NASCAR. I'm intense playing computer games or working at a sermon. I'm intense when I pre- I am just an intense person. God just, that's how he shaped me, right? But I think John's pretty intense here. He doesn't candy coat this. He doesn't say things like, well, whoever says I know him but doesn't do what he commands should probably check themselves over a little better. Should probably do a personal assessment. Should maybe get some advice from a pastor or a trusted friend. No, John says, you're a liar. Anyone who says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, get this, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Now, when we had the wedding yesterday, uh, Shannon and Mike uh, Radisky got married, and we talked about the idea that in Genesis, before the fall, this is before sin entered the world, this is before Eve ate the apple. Adam's looking around at all the animals, and he's naming them, male and female, and God says, you don't have a counterpart. And so God makes Eve and brings him to Adam, and Adam, Adam names him woman. And, G, and the Bible says right there, and this is before the fall of sin, God says, for this reason, a man will leave his home and be married to the woman, and the two will become one. Grafted out of that old relationship into a brand new relationship, which then becomes one. I think that's kind of what John had in mind here when he says, uh, but if anyone obeys his word, love of God is made complete in him. As we obey God, we're like a marriage coming together where we are now complete in God. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live as him, in him must live as Jesus did. Now, a few years ago, they had this big deal. They had bracelets and T-shirts, WWJD. Do you all remember that? WWJD, right? Anybody remember that? Or am I just the only one? What, what was that, WWJD? What would Jesus do, right? That was a really good, it was like a Hallmark moment. Oh, I have a decision to make. What would Jesus do? I don't like that because, number one, it ain't biblical. But number two, it gives us too many chances or too many opportunities to do the wrong thing. See, John isn't saying what would Jesus do. John is saying a little twist on that, WDJD, what did Jesus do? See, too many times we ask the question, what would Jesus do? And it allows us to ignore the fact, what did Jesus do? See, we've got the Bible. We've got the Gospels, which is the life of Jesus Christ, right? They tell us what Jesus did. They also tell us what he wants us to do. We don't have to ask some rhetorical question. Gosh, I wonder what Jesus would do. We've got the answer. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you've already broken all the commandments. And so John is saying here, whoever claims to live in him, do we all claim to be Christians? Yeah, right? It says, must live as Jesus did. 
Are you living like Jesus? Now, before you just give that snotty little, yeah, I live like Jesus. How did Jesus live? He cared more about others than he did himself. He came to earth to die for you and me. Only man in the history of the world born to die. We weren't born to die. We were born to live. That's why God gives us eternal life. Jesus Christ was born to die. Throughout his life, he gave everybody else everything that he had. He never regarded himself. He never took anything for himself. I, I, this psycho babble out here, I have to have something for myself so that I have something to give you. It's a bunch of it. It's a bunch of it. Jesus said this, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must first get something for himself. No, he said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must first deny himself. Jesus never thought about himself. He only thought about us. So when John says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, he said a mouthful. Now, we couldn't, he wouldn't say that if we couldn't do it. Now, we're never going to be sinless. Don't hear me saying that. But we can live as Jesus lived, if we really want to. If we want to be liars and deceive ourselves, we can have a, a little bit of an image of Jesus, but we'll never be sold out like he was. Now John goes on to say, he says, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had from the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. He's talking to the people that knew the Old Testament. He said, look, do you guys understand that what I'm saying right now ain't new? It sounds new because you've never been hit in the face with it before. This is what you would call radical living. I call it normal. What you're doing by not following Jesus Christ, that's radical living. That's a dumb departure from the way you were supposed to be. This is an old message. Any of you who know God's word, you know from Genesis to Malachi, I've been telling you this. Love the Lord your God. It was the first commandment I gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Have no other gods before me. It goes all the way through. And then he goes on to say, yet I am writing you a new commandment. Wait a minute, John. You just said it's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment. Now you're saying a new commandment. Yeah, but listen to how he says it. He says, yes, I am writing you a new commandment. Its truth is seen in him and in you. What kind of Jesus are you showing people every day? When people look at you, what do they think about Jesus? Now, for a lot of us, they don't even think about Jesus because we don't do anything to look like him. Why would they? But there's some of us that are showing a bad Jesus. We go out and tell everybody we're a believer. We got the fish on the back of our car, and then we cut people off in traffic, we cheat on our income tax, and we hurt people at work. What kind of Jesus are you showing people by your life? See, that's what John is saying here. Jesus said it this way. He starts by telling the people, I'm the light of the world. Remember that one? I'm the light of the world. And then he turns around and he says, you're the light of the world. As I die and come back to life and ascend to the Father, I'm sending you my spirit. That spirit is going to be inside you. And because my spirit lives in you, you are now the light of the world. Well, that's what John is saying here. John is saying this. He says, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you. What truth are you showing the world? He said, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. When Jesus came and lived on this earth, he showed us how to live. And so that light is already shining. The problem is it grates against the American dream and we keep trying to put it out. But I can't get away from verse 6 that says, whoever claims to live in him must do it, live as Jesus did. And I don't think Jesus bought into the American dream. I don't think Jesus believed everybody was supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I think Jesus said, you know what? You're only here for a short time. Then you're going to get eternity with everything that I have to give you. No mind, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive of what I got planned for those who love me. So if I ask you to live 75, 80, 100 years on this globe, is it too much to ask you to give that time away so that when you stand before me someday, I can reward you unbelievably? But no, 
We want to live this life and get all the gusto we can get. We want to save all the money we can have. We want to live in the nicest house we can find. We want to drive the nicest car we can drive. We want the biggest health care program and the highest 401k. We want to travel the world and see all the beautiful sights that are in the world. And we don't care that 87,000 people are going to die and go to hell within 15 miles of this church because we're in love with us. And so John is saying, I am, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. See, that's where we come back to Joe's sermon last week about family. See, he's not talking about blood brothers here and blood sisters. He's talking about believers. You are my brothers and sisters. And it says here that if I hate you, then I'm still in darkness. Anyone who loves his brothers and sisters lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. I love that. You see, you probably, you may have read that and passed right over that. It says, nothing in them to make them stumble. When you start living for yourself, when you think more of yourself than you do of others, when you think more of your biological family than you do your spiritual family, you stumble. Things get in your way. Things trip you up, and you always have problems. Somebody says, well, I got a financial problem. I say, well, I know what the problem is. What's that? You just don't love your brothers and sisters. He goes, dude, I just wanted you to balance my checkbook. Maybe the reason your checkbook doesn't balance is because you're not loving your brother and sister. Why don't you try loving your brother and sister and see if that problem with your checkbook doesn't go away. I get heartburn when I eat spaghetti. Well, maybe you should try loving your brothers and sisters. Wait a minute, why don't you just give me an antacid? Maybe the reason you're stumbling is because you're not loving your brothers and sisters. Do you ever think about that? God has some pretty peculiar consequences to some of the dumb things that we do. And when we get the first message wrong, a lot of the stuff in our life winds up messed up. When we start to think that marriage is for my happiness and my benefit and my goodness, a lot of times that marriage doesn't go so well. I, I've told you this before, you know, now in my marriage counseling, as a, just as a, a habit, when a couple comes in and wants to get married, first question I ask them is, why do you want to get married? Oh, and you get all those hallmark answers. Oh, I want to marry him because he's so handsome. And he works so hard, and he really respects my opinion. And, well, why do you want to marry her? Well, I, I want to marry her because she's a great cook, and, and she just cares so much for me, and she just makes me feel so good. And then I say, I'm sorry, I can't marry you. And they go, why? Why? You're getting married for the wrong reasons. What? Well, you said you're marrying him because he respects you. What happens when he doesn't respect you? You said you're marrying her because she's a good cook. What if she turns out not to be a good cook? Oh, he's a hunk. What happens when he gets one of these? She's a babe. What happens when she gets one of these? You're in it for the wrong reason. You know why I married Eileen? I married Eileen because I wanted to make, be, have a way to help her be all that she can be. I saw a young woman who loved the Lord with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I said, I want to be somebody that just helps her love him even more. You know what kind of love that is? That kind of love is unshakable because no matter what she does, I can still love her. See, my love for Eileen isn't dependent on what she does or is or thinks. I just chose to love her. And she did the same with me. We talk about this a lot. She chose to love me just because she chose to love me. She knows when I mess up, my, her love for me is not conditional upon my behavior. Her love for me is not conditional upon my doing all the things right. And when we start to get that right, we'll start honoring God with our marriages. When we start to see the marriage, the purpose of marriage is to honor God through a relationship, whoo, that marriage becomes really fun after that. And here's what John is saying. John is saying that anyone who hates his brother ain't in the light, anyone who loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing to make him stumble. You're, the, the obstacles in your life will disappear as you start to obey God. As you start to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, those things that trip you up and get in your way will go. Doesn't mean you'll, your life will be easy. You won't get cancer or have a cold or a hemorrhoid or a, a planter's wart. You'll still have all those things because we live in a broken world, but they won't cause you to stumble. 
You won't trip and fall. You won't be defeated. You'll have victory through it. He just concludes with this. He says, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going. Now, you know, Jesus did that too. Jesus, John and Jesus talked a lot, a lot, and that's a lot alike, and that's because John hung out with Jesus. And after Jesus died and he started preaching, they, the people paid attention to him because they knew that he'd been with Jesus. And you see, Jesus did the same thing. Jesus went to these people called the Pharisees, and they were so proud of themselves. They loved their religion. Oh, oh, oh I got a degree from the seminary in Jerusalem, and, and you know, I've got wealth, and you don't. And you know, my dad is red hot, and yours ain't diddly squat, and all that stuff, right? And Jesus looked at him one day, and he said, you are blind guides. If you want to read that passage, write that name down, Blind Guides, and Google it this afternoon, and you'll get the passage. Jesus came to these people who were the religious leaders. They were telling everybody else how to please God, and he looked at them and said, you guys are blind guides. Any, anybody here want to follow a blind guide? Stories told of a guy, he was out doing sales one day, and he came to this crossroads and he didn't know where he was and there was a farmer sitting over there on the porch in the rocking chair and so he said i'll just go over and ask this guy so he goes over to the farmer and he says excuse me sir can i ask you a question the guy says sure he says this road going off to the west where does it go and the farmer looks down and he goes you know what i've never been down that road i don't know where it goes hmm, all right this ro this road to the north where does it go and you know i don't know where that road goes either he goes oh all right, how about the one to the east? Surely you know where the one to the east goes. And he goes, no, I really don't know where that road goes either. I'm guessing you probably don't know where the road to the south goes either. And he says, no, I don't. He goes, why? You don't know very much. He goes, yeah, but I ain't lost. <laughs> See, are you following a blind guide? Are you a blind guide? Are you loving your neighbors as yourself? Are you loving the body of Christ like your own flesh and blood? If you are, you're a seeing guide. If you're not, you're a blind guide. And nobody should follow your example because they'll follow your blind path. As we close this off this morning, I want us to think about that. See, this is, this is it, guys and gals. It doesn't get any more basic than this. This is it. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets are based on these two principles. We don't have to learn anything more to fully actualize our Christian life. We just got to love God. When he said, don't have any other gods before me, he didn't mean that you could have ten gods and he's number one. He said, I don't even want him around there. Only one God. And then he said, love your neighbors yourself. God, I, I have to confess to you that 